Okay, so today it is the prerogative of the instructor and or the preacher to change things up. And we are going to today. So we're taking a little brief uh, break from Acts because, you know, I think I think it's prudent every once in a while uh, to, you know, we've gone through that series for so long and it's still going to be still going to take us some time to finally get through it, especially since we're uh, kind of looking at them more in chunks. But I've talked about this often and we're not going to go into this in detail necessarily but we are going to talk about this briefly and uh, and on the second half of that we're going to talk about the story of of Christ's parable of the prodigal son which I call the running father but I I've, I've been waiting and this is a good opportunity to talk about that so we are going this I think we will develop into a whole series because I live you you will live also and look at it really through the spectrum of the entire bible but this is found in John uh, verse four, verse nineteen, chapter fourteen, verse nineteen, kind of on the the end at the end of uh, verse fourteen. So we're going to look at chapter fourteen fairly briefly, look so that we can kind of see the context of this just in chapter fourteen, and then in a series we'll look at it uh, more globally, contextually in the entire Bible. But so let's go ahead and open to chapter fourteen. Um, and basically the main headings I have for this is one thing I want to say just at the outset, because I live, you will live also just the, con the, the comparison between Adam and, and Christ. Remember Adam was the first, uh, man. And then, uh, Christ is kind of the second Adam. So in God giving life to Adam, we have life in him. We have existence, you know, the image of God plant, you know, born in Adam and Eve. We live, we exist because of Adam. But ultimately, our eternal life is given by Christ. So through the one man, we have existence. Through the second Adam, we have abundant life eternally. And from the first Adam, the first Adam who died, we die. However, because of the second Adam, we live. See? See the comparison. With, with that which our first, our first Adam could not do and caused our fall and caused our sin has been lifted and taken on the cross in Christ. And now we have life through him. His life, so we have life because of his life and we have life because of his death. And ultimately his resurrection and his ascending to the right hand of God. But so that's one comparison of Adam and Eve. Also, this is obviously a causal, you know, this is a cause and effect situation. Christ is the cause. Ultimately, God is the cause. We will see this whole chapter is very Trinitarian. But because he lives, we will live also. He living is the cause. We are the effect. Our life, our eternal life in him is the effect. And we're going to see the beautiful way this is shown in chapter 14. Okay. So let's go to the first portion we have is verse 2, kind of the second half, and verse 3. Um, so, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Oh, uh, yeah, I have it. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so, this is part of the cause and effect. He goes to prepare a place for you. First, he starts by saying, uh, in my father's house are many mansions. Really different places. We looked at this before, but what he's saying is kind of another, another dual image, right? One is he goes to prepare a place, a location for us in heaven. The other really, because what he talks about is, is the father and Christ dwelling in us, making us his, uh, their dwelling, and also them, you know, the Father and the Son, God being our dwelling place. So really the house that he's talking about is in God. He goes to prepare a place for us to dwell in his presence, but really into the glory of God. He goes to prepare a place, and, uh, and, if, I, and if I go to prepare a place, first of all, when, when, also when he says, in my Father's house are many mansions, he says, if it were not so, I would have told you. That's because he's the son of God and he's incapable of lying. And But ultimately, I would have told you, if this was not the truth, I would have told you this is not the way. 
No, this is the way. I go to prepare a place for you. This is not in vain. I must go. Remember, he tells Philip, it's good that, that I go away. I must go. And the reason I must go, I go to prepare a place for you. Really, ultimately, the Spirit will come and, and, and lift you to the, presence, to the presence of God. Also, the Spirit will dwell in you. It's a, it's a, it's a two-way relationship where God dwells in us and we dwell in God because we are one. Remember, we talked about the marriage situation, and that's what it is. We are one. We are one. We're not just, a un We're not just united to Christ. We are one in Christ. Okay. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Okay. Let's go on there. The next one we have, this talks about the exclusivity. So verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So this, again, goes to, uh, into his, his exclusivity, that Christ is the way. This talks about, so he is the only way. He is the narrow path. Remember, he says, uh, narrow is the way to, to heaven, to eternal life. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. He is that narrow path. He is the only way, the exclusive way that we go to the Father, that we have access to God. Our problem with God is a broken relationship, which we'll see later, especially in the, the parable of the par, uh, prodigal son. But it is a broken relationship. In sin, we have broken our, our, our relationship to God. Okay, And we suppress that knowledge until... By God's grace, he comes running, running us down like the hound of heaven he is, you know, and saves us. He comes to us. We don't go to him. But so he is the, the, the way in that way. He is the truth as it relates to. Remember, even in the fall, when when the serpent came to tempt uh, Eve, he says, hath God really said? Ultimately, every sin starts with that question. Every every temptation starts with that question. Hath God really said? Has God really said? It? And is what he says true? Number one, is, is this even really what he said? And number two, can you trust him? That's where the fall happens. He is the, he, the absolute truth. This is a really brief, but this is one way. This is how we're going to show. Um, and that, that uh, uh, he is the life. So just as God breathed life into man out of the dust now god christ through the spirit remember spirit can also mean breath can also mean wind it can also mean air now through christ the spirit is given us life he fills us with his spirit and he is the the abundant life he is the life again we we, we think of life like this this is existence this is this is this is temporal he is not his life is not temporal it's not fleeting, and it's not pathetic either. It's grand. It's full life. He is the full way, the only way, and the fullness of that path, though, though it's narrow, it's full of abundance and blessings, some trials and tribulations, but for our good along that narrow path. He is the ultimate truth. We talked about that whole, we went through that whole series of truth. He is truth incarnate. He is truth made in the flesh. And he is life in the flesh. But through him, we have abundant life, especially with the Spirit breathing into us. Okay. Next one. Uh, so, again, chapter 14, verses 15 through 18. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father. This is where we start the Trinity. The, the heading of this is the Trinity. Uh, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. So, this is, so again, if you, if you love me, first of all, if you love me, the better translation would probably be, you will keep my commandments. It's not like, if you love me, keep my commandments. He's not saying, you know, He's not giving this as a qualifier. He's basically saying, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Because that love, which I've told you, you know, our appreciation for Christ and, what, and his dwelling into us, in, in us with, by his spirit, engenders, engenders obedience, willful obedience, happy obedience. So if we love him, we will keep his commandments, which, which aren't like the law given unto Moses. It's not this huge 
direct basically is he's one of his commandments was to love one another to love each other just like i've loved you and in so doing the world will know that you are my disciples because you love one another so that's one of his commandments but his ultimate command is believe in me and if you can't believe in me he even tells them believe in the works for the sake of the works that i do because the works that i do bears testimony that i am the christ and i am here to save God has sent his son to suffer and to save. But, so, if you love me, if, if you truly love me, if you are my disciple, you will, you will keep my commandments because I am in you. Okay. Uh, and I will pray the Father. Here's where we start the Trinity. See? So, so if you love me, and you, you will keep my commandments. And I, the Son of God, will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. This is paraclete. But also, let us see the, the parallel which with, with uh, Adam and Eve. Remember when, when God had, had uh, said that it's not good the man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Remember? And then he brought in all these, those animals. And there was no helper comparable to him. This helper is, is, not, is incomparable. He, he sends the ultimate help, helper. Not, again, the incomparable helper. The Spirit. This is Paraclete. So the Spirit comes to to indwell us, to be one with us, and to come alongside us, to give us the power, to give us His glory, to give us His presence, to give us His truth, uh, that He may abide with you forever. So when Christ ascends to the Father, remember that day of Pentecost when He sends the Spirit. When the Spirit dwells, when you are saved, when God hunts you down and saves you, this, you are filled with the Spirit. Again, you enter the kingdom of life now until you have it for eternity. That starts here, but that will last forever. So we will have the Spirit of God until eternity runs out. When will eternity run out? Never. When will God cease to be? When will the Spirit of God never not become a thing? So when will we, ha how long will we have this truth? How long will we have his spirit? How long will, sh will we enjoy his presence? Forever. Forever. It starts here. It's a wonderful, merciful act of God that he is doing. Let us remember that. Okay. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. Now he's kind of using, again, a little bit of interplay. Because, again, God is one. So when he refers to the Spirit, he's also speaking to himself uh, about himself. Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Just like we can say about the world. They saw him in his, in his physical form, but they did not know him. Remember, he even said that about uh, Nicodemus. And, and, but really, the rulers and stuff that, that didn't know him. And even the apostles are saying that later on in Acts. If you remember that. Um, but you know him, for he dwells with you. That's Christ. We talked about this. For he dwells with you. Right now, the Spirit hasn't come. So the Pentecost has not happened. Christ is there. Because they're one. Christ and the Spirit are one. Right now, he's dwelling with them uh, and will be in you. That's the Spirit coming to, uh, to fill his disciples. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. This is so sweet. This is so sweet. Again, he's, he's comforting his disciples. He's going away. He's going to be crucified. But also, this is a great comfort to us as well. He has not left us orphans. We have the greatest father. You know, God is our father. We, we are not only not orphans. We are the most glorious children. We ought to be so abundantly grateful that we are called children of God, not only has he not left us orphans, but he has come to us to be his eternal and sacred children, to be his people. That promise that began in Genesis 3 is coming to pass. It's coming to pass. And, and again, from eternity for eternity. Okay. Good thing I'm not paying attention to my notes at all. Oh, by the way, let's go back real quickly, though. Because the Trinity, so I know the Trinity is a mystery, but we are all baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit or ghosts. Some people say ghosts. It's interchangeable. But so every Christian 
every Christian by nature must be a Trinitarian. The Trinity isn't spelled out in the Bible. There's no word Trinity. However, we are commanded to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So every Christian by nature must be a Trinitarian. That's, that's just something I wanted to say kind of in passing. Okay, so this the heading for this is Everlasting Peace. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in, the, in my Father and you in me and I in you. See, you and me and I in you. It's dual relationship. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Going back to what he said. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, uh, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, here we go. Here's a better translation. Uh, he will keep my word and, him, and my father uh, will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. So again, he prepares a place for us. Also, he prepares a place for us in ourselves, for him, for he and the Father in the Spirit to dwell in us. Okay, okay. But a little while longer, and the world, uh, and the world will see me no more. Again, he's 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 going to his crucifixion. And he will ascend to the Father, and the world will see him no more. And the world will disbelieve in him. It, even the fact that he ever existed—that's where we are in our contemporary time. That's where we are. That he even existed, they, they question. So the world will know, see me no more. Neither will they care. They do, they've never known me, and they will never see me. So the world will see me no more, but you will see me. How? His physical body is gone. His physical body is in heaven. How do we see him? We see him, because, first of all, by his spirit. But so, because he lives, we will live also. So a little while longer, the, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me in the spirit because I live, not because I'm dying. Yes, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to raise, be raised again on the third day. But because I live, because I, exi because I am, you will be also. Because I am. Remember, he even refers to himself as I am. Okay, because I am, that's a probably a, a nicer translation too. Because I am, you will be also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father. Remember, the, the, the disciples at this time don't know anything about that. And even after the resurrection, they're still slow to understand. They're, they're, they understand more after his resurrection. But it's really at, the, at that day of Pentecost when the Spirit comes and, and, and fills that house and the, and the men are given uh, the ability to speak in different languages, that's where their understanding is heightened to, to, to preach salvation. They at least understand it more than, and they understand it fully on that, on that day, that he is in the Father, and uh, you will know that he is in the Father, and since he is in the Father, he is in us. Again, the Trinity takes their place, takes his place in us through the Spirit. And you and me, and I and you, again. So we rest in the presence and, and, and in the dwelling in the house of our God, and God takes, brings his temple to us. You'll see that a little bit in the, the next parable, but it's, it's something you're going to have to meditate on, and it's something that's very beautiful. But it's because of this that we, we live also. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Again, that goes back to uh, what he said. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So when we see somebody following his, his example, following his precepts, and following his teachings, we know that that is a true Christian because uh, it is he who loves him. It, it is that person, it is that man or woman that, that obviously loves him. And he who loves me will be loved by my father because, again, the, the father is there the son is in the father so again they're all one uh, uh, and I will love him and manifest myself to him show myself to him I will glorify myself in him my presence my heavenly eternal presence I will manifest that to you I'm not going to leave you orphans I'm not going to leave this a hidden secret I have no desire to make this some esoteric mystical experience for you 
No, I will come and I will dwell in you and manifest myself to you. Everything that he is, all of the blessings, all of the fullness of Christ is ours to be had. Again, can you imagine, you know, I have some something of great worth and I just keep it to myself? I, I, I would never, I, I couldn't imagine doing that. Especially that which we're supposed to share. My wife, Sarah, and I are supposed to share this grand, priceless thing and I just keep it to myself. Our Christ is not that way. All of his fullness is ours to be had for the asking. He's more than pleased. He, that's what he wants. And manifest myself to him. Either way, I'm going to do this. <laughs> it's really a question of how much you embrace him. And thereby embracing him you and loving him, you follow his commandments and you follow his word and you seek him out. Okay. Um, Judas asked, uh, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to, to the, uh, and not to the world? If anyone loves me, he will keep it. So again, the world cannot know him because they don't, don't love him. You know, they don't love him. And so they don't lo know him. They don't see him. They disbelieve. They think the whole thing is ridiculous. You know, so again, he doesn't manifest himself. He, he has manifested himself in the world in the fullness of time. And even then, when he was physically present, the people didn't see him. The, dis the people who weren't called to him did not see him or knew, knew, know him. Um, and we will make our home with him. So, uh, he, uh, you know, he, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. Again, it goes right back to that. And we will come to him and make our home with him again in the spirit. This is a gracious thing. This is a wonderful thing. God didn't just leave his word for us to read about him and, and to learn about him. And that's it. He didn't just, you know, throw this down from heaven and say, okay, good luck. Hopefully we'll see you on the other side. No, he, he gives us his holy word to also grow in his presence. He makes his home with us. He makes our home in him. It's a wonderful, beautiful, tremendously gracious act of God that we don't deserve. We don't deserve, but he desires. He desires his beloved. Okay, now the second half. Again, this parable is better called the running father. I love this parable. And again, though, we're going to see it and consider it fairly briefly until we come across it again. But this is found in Luke chapter 15. And we will start at verse 11. We'll go back and talk about the other ones. Just so you know, chapter 15. So let's first start at the beginning. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him and to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying. So he ends up saying three parables. And, and Luke uh, records it as one parable. Because it's one kind of constant. There's three different parables saying the same thing. All three of these parables have to do with finding something that was lost or someone that was lost, all three of them. Uh, but real quickly, just to start this up. So back then, the Qumrans would, would be completely ascetic. There, there were a sect of Jews who would be completely separate from the world and isolated in that respect. The Pharisees and the Sadducees thought that we should be isolated from sinners and tax collectors. That, that basically, if we, if we, um, in company of them, you know, if we join in the company of them and eat with them and everything, then we are basically endorsing their sin. That's what they believe. Okay, so that's just important to recognize at the outset uh, before we go on and go into this parable. And we'll see that uh, throughout this parable. But let's go ahead and go to verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons and the, fa and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger uh, son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he, uh, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine, to feed swine. And he would gladly have fill, filled his stomach with the paws that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. 
But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I, have per and I perish with, with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and, am no, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But, he was, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, son, for my son was, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I had never tr transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that, that I might make, make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. All right. Let me change it here because that's going to be hard for me to follow. Here. Okay. So, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. We need to understand, give a little bit of cultural background. First of all, this would be an offensive in our own time. Basically, if any of y'all, if either of you came to me and asked me for your inheritance before I die, basically, he's coming up to his father and saying, look, this is a real inconvenience for me. You know, you need to either go off and die or just give me my inheritance. I'm tired of waiting. You know, I, I just, why don't you just give me my inheritance now and, and, and whatever, you know, so I don't have to wait for you to die. This would be a huge offense back then. Basically, the penalty for that could very well be and sh was the death penalty. It's a huge offense. It's a gross offense. The father, you have to understand in that day, and even in cultures today in other areas of the world, what had, was highly respected. When the father walked in the room, everybody stands up. It's just a lot of things there. So this would be considered from the community and, and any of their other family, their relatives, a gross offense, a terrible offense that this younger son is coming and asking for his, his inheritance. However, so, so the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions of goods that falls, of goods that, the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. The father sells all of his possessions, all of his stuff. He divides and he gives to the younger and the older. Let's remember that because we're going to consider the older son later. But they both got the inheritance early. The one didn't ask for it, but he also didn't deny it. He also didn't say, no, father, I, 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 far be it from me. No, this, my brother offended you. I have no interest in doing that. No, you were my father. And, and this, is, this whole thing is a scandal and scandalous. And I have no interest in being a part of that. He did not do that. He also received his part of the inheritance. Okay. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Now, prodigal living basically means extravagant living. So he went and bought like the prime camel, like a two hump camel with like streamlines and like spinner wheels, you know, maybe gold plated hooves or whatever, you know, just the, he just spent all of his uh, uh, money on extravagant living. We, that's important because later the, the older brother accuses him of spending it on harlotry, on, on basically prostitution. There's nothing in here that says that. And we'll get to that later, but there's nothing in here that says that. He basically just went and wasted it all. He didn't earn it. He didn't earn it. And he, he has no regard for his father at this point. He has no uh, uh, regard for his father. 
basically he has regard for his riches, for his inheritance, and he's very excited to go and just live in luxury, in the bath of luxury. He goes and buys all the good things, goes and hangs out and parties at the at the most extravagant parties. You know, he's the he's in the high class, you know, and enjoying that life until he spends it all. He ends up spending it all. Uh, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. So he's broke, and there's a famine. That's a terrible place to be. There is no source of provision. He has no means, and he, had, he doesn't have a trade. He didn't make this money. He, he, do, he doesn't have anything to offer to, to produce anything. He had been working for his father, and he just comes and at, so let that be a lesson. Everybody thinks that like uh, what would be great in our life is just a ton of money and that would answer all of our problems. No, sometimes that creates problems. That created a problem for him. This was the worst decision he could have made. But it turns out to be, to be a tremendous blessing by God's grace again. But so he, he sold all and, and he obviously uh, became to be in want. Um, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to, swing, to feed swine. This is a Jew. Jesus is telling this story. So first of all, at the beginning, so the Jews come to him, right? And, and, they're, and they're saying, basically, this person, this man is, is joining with tax collectors and sinners. He's endorsing these sins. And Jesus is telling them, a certain man has two sons. The younger of them comes and asks for the inheritance. And, and I guarantee you, those Pharisees are like, oh, yeah, Jesus, I know where you're going with this. They kill him, right? No, they don't kill him. <laughs> he divides the story. And so they're like, okay, that's interesting. Let's keep on finish, listening to the story. Okay, oh, wow, he sold all, you know, he lost all, and now he's impoverished. And now he's, he's, he's hired to feed swine, to feed the pigs. Remember, pigs were filthy animals. They're unclean animals. Not only can you not eat them, you cannot touch them. There's a lot there. But he's... All, that's all he's left with. He has no other option. He's, he has to go feed the swine. And he's so badly poor, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. He's not going to eat the pig. He's not going to eat the pig. He's not going to go so far as to eat the pig, but he, he wants to eat the thing, what the pigs are eating. He just needs something. He needs some sustenance, and he's, he's that terribly off. Okay. Um, and no one gave him anything, not even the pods that the pigs are eating this poor man who came in all of this extravagance is getting nothing from the people getting nothing okay but when he came to himself let's remember that we've been talking about coming to yourself this son comes to himself but to a certain extent in in a certain context um, but when he came to himself he said how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. So here I am, here I am, and uh, you know I'm I'm perishing, I'm starving, I can't find any provision, I can't find a job, I can't find anything, and at my father's house he has hired servants with bread enough and to spare. So his father w was so wealthy that he his servants were given provisions. And even they always had leftovers kind of thing. They had bread enough and to spare. There's a lot there that we'll get into, God willing, when we look at this. But he knows that, that, that his, in his father's house, in the sons and the servants are provided with, with enough and to spare. And, and he knows that. Okay. Uh, uh, and I perish with hunger. So he makes a plan. I will rise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no, worthy, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one, one of your hired servants. And he rose. So this is his plan. We don't know how actually contrite he is at this point. We don't know how sincere this is at this point. Right now, he's about to die, and so the only option I have is to return to my father. Now, let's go back. Now we're talking about a different story. The one in the beginning, it, it could have uh, it deserved, could have been uh, given the death penalty just for that. Coming back with nothing, definitely death sentence. And it would be a terrible death sentence, and I'm not going to get into too much details. Basically, you would walk through the village while everybody's stoning you until you're dead. You would be forced 
to walk through and everybody stones you to stones you to death. So when he's got, and he knows that. He knows that's a that's a distinct possibility, but he's left with no option. So he makes a plan. He says, I will rise and go to my father, risk my life because I'm already dying here. <laughs> and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against uh, heaven before you. You know, I, I'll, I'll say to him, I'll, I'll say this confession. He doesn't say, and I will confess to him. He says, and I will say to him. This is the, what I'm going to say to him. Just like a lot of people when they come before God and just say the Lord's Prayer or just say a prayer and not actually be confessing, not actually be speaking to God. He's preparing a speech. He's preparing something that he's hoping will engender mercy from the community, not just his father. He's not concerned with his father at this point. At this point. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Again, this seems like contrition, uh, but, but this is something that he's saying. Make me like one of your hired servants. Just so you know, the Greek in this would be the, one of the top servants. So basically, he would be getting paid even for his service. But he's saying, you know, hire me, is, you know, uh, make me like one of your hired servants. You know, I'm not your son. I'm not worthy to be called your son. I'm not asking you to, you know, bring me back into the family because I've sinned. What I did was terrible. and I don't deserve that. I, I really deserve death. But, you know, instead of that, just make me like one of your hired servants. I, I know I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. Just make me one of your uh, hired servants. <sighs> and he arose and came to his father. <sighs> but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The father is old. Again, if we look at the old culture again, they had robes at that time. So when you'd run, when you had to run, oh great, when you had to run, you'd have to lift up your robe. So it was kind of disgraceful. Old men didn't run. Men, older men just didn't run out of a, an abundance of reasons. But really one of the reasons is because it's kind of disgraceful. But this father can't handle it. He's lost his son. Nobody, talk, nobody th thinks about the father here. Terrible terrible account for him his son you know his two sons but one son comes to him and asks for his inheritance which he shouldn't go so he's really just waiting for me to die that's that's terrible i'm not going to scold him I, you know that wouldn't do anything just like god does to us evil starts because what we desire and when we're just content, when we're hell bent on this evil desire, God will let us have it. He will grant it. That's how evil happens. God does not make evil. That's how evil happens. But this father has two sons. One just wants him to die. So he gives him his inheritance and he takes off. This, to this father, this son is dead. This, this son is gone off from him. And even though if, if he were to scour the earth and find him, his son would want nothing to do with him. His son is lost. His son is away from him. And he sees him. His, his father's sitting on the porch. I don't know. He's hanging out somewhere. And many, maybe many people saw him. The father saw him. The father saw him. He didn't sit and wait. No. He ran, picked up his robe, and ran and fell on his neck. It's a very intimate embrace. And he kissed him. So he fell on his neck, and so he's kissing him all over. He can't help it. He can't stop. His son, who was lost, is now found. And he just can't stop loving on him. He embraces him. Now, so he comes and runs. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your, in, in your sight. I am no, worthy, no longer worthy to be called your son. Where's that whole bit about being hired as one of his servants? That's gone. 
now the son is contrite because God, because his father, the hound of heaven, has run him down. He doesn't deserve to be called his son. He doesn't deserve this at all. But because of the mercy and the grace and the love of his father, this is a parable talking about Christ, talking about God the Father, and our broken relationship. This is a broken relationship that is mended by the Father. It is not mended by the Son who comes back. The other parables that were before this was of the, was of the, the, the one sheep being lost, and, and the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes and finds the one, which is a very hazardous and dangerous proposition. Sheep are idiots. Sheep are really f stupid, and especially when they're lost, they're, they just wander around, and then they, they just kind of sit somewhere, and they make this pathetic bleeding, uh, uh, bleating sound until they're found. But, you know, there's a lot of danger in, in, in going and searching for the sheep. But he goes, and he finds the sheep, and he throws them on the shoulder and carries them back and, you know, brings the community together and says, Re rejoice with me. I found, I found the one sheep that was lost, you know. And then the next parable about, is about a, a, a woman losing a coin and she sweeps her entire house and she she had 10 coins and she lost the one it's just a minor parable anyway and she sweeps her whole house and she finds it and she tells everybody rejoice for i found the the coin everybody talks about this parable as some glorifying deal about the prodigal, prodigal son he came to himself and since he came to himself he came and sought his father's repentance what is the reason for the rejoicing in all three of these parables was it, was it the, you know, the lost sheep? Did all the sheep come around the, 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 the lost sheep and said, oh, wow, how, how brilliant of you, how good of you to come back into the fold. And, and then the other coins did, were like everybody, did everybody come around the one coin that was lost and said, good job, good job being found. Way to go, you. And did everybody come to the, the sun and say, way to go, good for you to come back. You're starving. No, it is the shepherd who went and found the sheep. It is the woman who swept her house to find the coin. And it is his father who is running out to him because his son who was lost is now found and he has him. That is the cause of rejoicing. It is not because the son was gonna die and he had no other option. That's why this is better referred to and Eastern Orthodox churches actually call it this, and it's way more fitting to call this parable the parable of the running father. Not about the prodigal son. This story is about two lost sons. It is not just this one who's lost. The other one receives the inheritance, and we will see the, the rest of his story. But these are two lost sons. One, much to his gladness, much, much to his gratefulness to God, much to his thanksgiving and peace, he returns. And, and through his father's compassion, he repents, truly repents. So, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. For this son, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He is lost and is found. And they began to be merry. His father doesn't disagree. He doesn't say, oh, no, 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 no. You're totally worthy to be called my son. No. He, he says, go, get his robe, get a robe, get the, get, get the ring. Basically, all of the garments of a son. He, he. He doesn't argue. He doesn't say, oh, yes, you are worthy because you decided to come and repent. No, he says, that's great. I am making you worthy. I have called you worthy. I love you. You are not my son because you've earned it. You are my son because I love you. That's our relationship to God. I, 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 tell, you know, I tell you to seek him, and I do, I do continue to implore you to seek him, but he is the hound of heaven, this running father. That's why I love that poem. The hound of heaven. I wasn't saved because I, I was enlightened and decided, oh, God's a great option. No, he came to me. He came and ran me down, just like he will come and run you down. 
I say seek after, and once you find him, you will turn around and recognize that he's been pursuing you the whole time. Okay, let's continue. My iPad died, so I have to go to the book. <laughs> Excuse me, one second. Three fifteen in the morning. Okay. Okay, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. Again, here's another great cause for a feast. Here's another great cause for a feast. We saw that with Abraham, and now the father is is rejoicing. He's throwing a party, just like at salvation. Every time Christ says, Christ says, every time a sinner is saved, all of heaven rejoices. That's what that's what Jesus is showing here. That's what Jesus is showing. Okay. Uh, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to be married again. Begin, they begin to be married again. This is the cause of their rejoicing. It's not because the son came in repentance. It's because the father ran out to him. And, and he has his son. And that relationship is mended. Their relationship is true now. The son knows himself and he knows his father and the love and the tremendous co compassion that he doesn't deserve, and his father still gives him. <sighs> now his older son was in the field, and he came. And as he came over and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And this is different for him. I mean, you you think about a huge party, you know, you hear the music in the back, you know, in the distance, and he doesn't know what's going on. So he's he asks uh, a servant, and just so you know, the word. For this, for this servant, it really means a very little boy. And so he goes and asks this kind of little boy what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. That's key, just real quickly. He says, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry. It would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Again, two lost sons. He's, this, this son is angry now because... To him, again, the, the younger son started this whole offense off in the first place. Everybody thinks, a lot of people think, that this parable is an unjust parable for the, other, for the older son. It is not. Again, they both received the inheritance. They both did. Yes, the one went off, but that doesn't make his sin any less a sin. But he doesn't realize that. He still sees himself as self-righteous. Just like the Pharisees, that's why Christ has given this parable. Just like many uh, Christians in our own day, that's why Christ has given this parable. The, son, the other son gets angry. You know, this, you're, this uh, well, let's continue. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So his father came out and pleaded with him. So he, said, so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have ne never transgressed your commandment at any time. Isn't true. He took the inheritance. Uh, and yet you never gave me a young goat. Isn't true. He, gave, he, took his, he received the entire inheritance that I might make merry with my friends. First of all, oh, but as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. First of all, but as soon as this son of yours came, he's not even calling him his brother. The servant says, your brother is returned. He has no love for his brother and apparently little lo love for his father. He's serving him as a slave, just like nominal Christians do, just like the scribes and Pharise or the, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes of, of Christ's time. Just worship a name and, and seek to perform their own righteousness. And that's where this son was. He just thought since since he was still doing the since when his father said and commanded him to go out into the field that he would go out into the field that he's a faithful son. No, he still received the inheritance, and he still the older son actually had. So let's say even in that circumstance, the 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 father is asked, you know, for the inheritance, and let's say the father is ready to acquiesce. It is up to the older son, and is totally his responsibility to say no. No, that is not what we're doing. No, Father, I, I respect you, but that is wrong. That is where you rebuke as a father, though. But that is where the older son does have that responsibility. Not only just authority, but he has the responsibility. He completely did not. So he received his own inheritance. 
And now he's all angry at his, his brother, but he's not even calling him his brother. And then he accuses him, him of wasting all of the, that money on harlotry. What? Did, did he, like, hire some spy? Is he some secret agent? Like, he knows what his brother did? No. He's just assuming all of this. He's just assuming the worst of his brother because he thinks the best of himself. That's the point. Just like the scribes, just like the Pharisees, just like the Sadducees, just like all, or many, well, all fallen men and women do and have throughout time. That's how this older brother is. And, um, and then his father answered him and said, said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours, especially now. Basically, I've given you the entire other inheritance. Your brother spent all the rest. So everything I have is literally yours. <laughs> it's truly yours. Uh, it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Christ brilliantly ends the parable that way. He doesn't tell us what happened to the older brother. You can be a uh, happy romantic and, and think that he joined. Uh, in the party and came to himself and repented um, or you can think that he never did and kept being wayward Christ doesn't tell us what happened because ultimately the story hasn't ended until that day the day of Christ that story still continues that other son still has hope for repentance he still has a very compassionate and loving father but it's a matter of that father and, and him seeing who his father is. Both of them were lost. The father remained the same the entire time. The father loved them the entire time. They were lost. One put himself into a very precarious situation that basically made it necessary for him to return to his father. Just like when we come to himself, ourselves and we re recognize that we are destitute, of <laughs> we are totally incapable of saving ourselves. We know we have a father whose servants have bread enough and to spare. Much more does he have for his children. So much more does he have for his children, his body, who he nourishes and cherishes. See? See how all of this comes together? There's a verse in... Uh, Isaiah chapter 55, it's talking about salvation, how it's without money and without price. It's purchased without money and without price. I think it's fitting that it's both money and without price. Remember, Simon Magus tried to purchase the power of the Spirit, and Peter, you know, Peter uh, rebuked him for that. But, uh, so, obviously, no amount of money we can bring to Christ to save us but also without price. A lot of men and women will, will, will be reluctant to come to God until they make themselves better. They think that if they make themselves valuable enough, then God will receive you. No, no. God, Christ receives you just as you are. You bring nothing to the table except yourself. He comes... He comes running you down, falling on your neck, and kissing you just as you are. All you're seeking does not purchase salvation. All your desire for him gains not a morsel of heaven. It is his salvation. And he comes to us. And once he comes to us, yes, that engenders a great and tremendous amount of gratitude and love and affection for our God. And if we love him, we keep his commandments. Father, full of strength and power, Christ our Savior, word made flesh, Holy Spirit, our peace each hour, we baptize and is three refreshed. Life in thee is life indeed, our God from death thou save that Emmanuel's veins did bleed, roses from the dusty grave. The world is black in shadows, is but a fading fallen doom. 
full of charity and gallows, a contradiction in its womb. All was made and blessed as good, and in faithlessness we fell. Our own master we withstood, and turned paradise to hell. But glory, joy abundant, are ours to have in him. For Christ is most triumphant, he our sweet eternal hymn. In all his vast and plenteous gifts, his bride he gladly gives. And all of this ever consists in that we live because he lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your abundant grace. Thank you for your tremendous mercy. We thank you that you have not left us to wander aimlessly to seek you. You come and run us down, the gracious and almighty Father of heaven, that you might have us absolutely unworthy. We are not worthy to be called your sons and daughters. But you have robed us in the likeness of your son, that we are called your sons and daughters. Father, magnify this truth to us. Let us see you in all of your radiance and in all and thanksgiving. Lift up praise to you forever. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat>